All right, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Simon Harada. His overall research program is focused on the regulation of the innate immune system signaling in the GI tract in the context of acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. He's specifically interested in how the intestinal epithelium and resident mucosal immune cells contribute to inflammatory disease pathogenesis in the GI tract. And as such, he examines how inflammatory signaling is initiated in the cells of the intestinal mucosa and how these events can be modulated by various immunomodulatory factors, including antibiotics, environmental factors, and I believe uh, bacterial uh, derivatives. I came, became aware of Dr. Harada through some of my research. And so Dr. Harada, without further ado, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. You know, this, I got to say, this, this seminar series has been a lot of fun. You know, tuning in on, on, on Friday mornings for me has been, you know, a regular occasion. And I got to say, I've, I've learned a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, being exposed to a variety of different things is always, is always fun because you get new ideas. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, a variety of stories, one published and one unpublished, uh, related to some of the work that we've been doing in the lab, um, going back to my original training as a pharmacologist. So as Jeff mentioned, you know, I, I do work on pathways of inflammation in the gut in the context of inflammatory bowel diseases. But what I'm going to talk about today are essentially side projects. And I was joking before with Jeff that, you know, this just kind of highlights how unfocused we can be at times. But, you know, this is this is where it gets fun. So although um, I, I have a research chair and host microbe interactions, um, you know, the first thing I want to highlight is in reality, I'm not a trained uh, immunologist or a microbiologist. And I was trained as a physiologist and as a pharmacologist and kind of thrown into uh, a lot of what we're doing now, uh, which which makes it fun. You know, again, it, it makes it interesting and fun. So as I start to introduce the talk, I'm just going to go into, you know, some very basic pharmacology concepts just to make sure we're all on the same page. And, you know, it relates to basically the first three chapters in my favorite pharmacology textbook, Rangadale. Cat song is okay as well. But, you know, this, this is, the, the, I think these concepts are important to, to really appreciate, um, you know, some of the findings that we've, uh, that we've uncovered. So the first thing is pharmacodynamics. And, you know, most of us can appreciate that, you know, pharmacodynamics is essentially how the drug works in the body. I found this wonderful YouTube video uh, that, I, that I use in, in, in my undergraduate pharmacology teaching. You know, and this is, this is very basic. The drug acting on the body, pharmacodynamics. And then there's the other way around you know, the, the, the pharmacokinetic side of things and really how the body is, is acting on the drug, you know, to uh, modify it in such a way that, you know, can either be eliminated or, you know, function, um, you know, as an active compound. So, you know, my old school pharmacology training, uh, you know, I, I can remember these concepts, but I kind of strayed away from that uh, for, for quite a number of years, about 10 years, where I really focused on epithelial biology, mucosal immunology, nuclear receptors, but you know, we, we really started to kind of turn this around. We start we started to see um, a lot of novel uh, concepts in terms of you know how new factors or at least new input to the system could actually regulate pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And as we can all appreciate, you know, drugs have to enter the body. You know, they they uh, undergo you know a variety of processes related to pharmacokinetics, and then eventually elicit their effect. And in the end, you know, we need to get you know, a, a reasonable concentration of the drug at the site uh, of action, you know, in order to elicit, you know, the effect that we desire, you know, but, but really it's a balance between getting that desired effect and, and toxicity. And for some compounds, you know, that's, that's very narrow, right? So, you know, we've, we've started to look at this with additional players uh, in terms of how the, the microbiota can actually um, control the, the, the balance between the desired effect and toxicity. So as we can all appreciate, you know, there's the, the, the field of the microbiota and how it regulates uh, host health is, has blown up over the past 10 or 15 years. And a variety of, of, of surfaces are colonized by uh, microbial communities. And I, I, I mean, I, I limit it to microbial communities in this context, but obviously we've got the virome, we've got the fungome and archaea and so on. But, you know, suffice to say, we're heavily colonized by other organisms which obviously have uh, effects on, on the host function, uh, most of which are beneficial. And when we look at you know, the colonization and really the, the potential functional impact of colonization, you know, the microbial genes that, that uh, are contained within the communities that, that, that live on our surfaces you know, clearly, clearly have you know, the ability 
you know, to, to do a lot of stuff, essentially. And when we look at the communities, this is just in the context of, of the gut, you know, there's a lot of diversity uh, within the communities of microbes that live within our systems. And what I like to, uh, to point out is, you know, the, the diversity between individuals, we all have different communities that, that exist on us. And yet really the functional impact is, is pretty similar in most cases when we're talking about healthy individuals. So I tend to think that, you know, despite the fact we have uh, a pretty tremendous diversity in, 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 the, uh, in, in the communities that colonize us, the functional output is the same and, and, and in most cases is, is beneficial to a, a variety of processes. And we look at what is known about, you know, how the microbiota affects a variety of different processes within the host. You can see here a number of different processes, including uh, areas within the gut, um, you know, but also uh, areas systemically where the microbiota uh, plays a role in regulating mostly homeostatic processes and in the context of uh, perturbation of those communities can lead to disease. And we also, we don't really know the chicken and egg scenario. You know, does, does the disease condition uh, lead to change in the community uh, that maybe then, you know, further propagate or further drive uh, the disease condition? So, you know, it's, it's, it's still up for debate. Uh, I think in many diseases or in many, in many uh, perturbed states, uh, whether the change in the microbial composition or functional output is cause or effect. But you know, my opinion is we need to really get to cause and effect, and we really need to get to mechanistic studies to understand you know, how, how the microbiota is impacting all of these systems. And one of the systems that we've been very interested in uh, as of late is the, the idea that the microbiota can actually uh, regulate or contributes to the regulation of the metabolism of drugs and also uh, drug outcomes. You know, there have been a number of very, very, um, you know, high quality, high impact uh, papers that, that have uh, been published in the last two years that have really uh, highlighted the, the uh, impact of uh, microbial communities and the response to uh, really important drugs, including uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So I've got a really talented postdoc in my lab who trained as a pharmacologist um, as a PhD uh, and then went to... Um, to train uh, in, in uh, Georgia State University with uh, a really, really good mucosal immunology lab. And, and, and what Kyle's done uh, for my lab is really, really you know, elevated our game in terms of the, the immunology that we can do, but also the work we can do in the microbiota. So all of the work I'm gonna talk about today is, is, is basic, was basically driven by him. Uh, and the, the last story uh, that's unpublished is, is really gonna be what he, uh, he hopes to take away uh, as he transitions uh, in, into a faculty position. So we've, we've been talking about the, the potential role for the microbiota in regulating drug metabolism and drug responsiveness for quite a while. As you can see, this is a 2016 paper. But in this particular review, a lot of this was, was very much hypothetical um, and, you know, and, and mechanisms um, and, and, uh, and, and such were really not um, known at that point in time. And really, uh, you know, it, we understood something was happening, but, um, you know, trying to probe uh, direct mechanisms and, and really understand how that translated to, say, you know, human drug responsiveness was, was you know, was, was pretty much in the hypothetical state at that point. But suffice to say, there are a number of potential mechanisms whereby the microbiota, and let's just focus uh, in the context of the intestine to make it easier, and let's focus um, with, with drugs that you're likely going to take orally. There are a number of ways that the microbiota can uh, can basically govern drug efficacy, but also toxicity. You have prodrugs um, that are often metabolized by enzymes within the microbiota, leading to, you know, the the liberation of an active um, uh, compound that that elicits its effect. You also have uh, active compounds that can be um, inactivated by enzymes within the microbiota. And then you also have the issue of toxicity, and that's what I'm going to highlight in in the first story today. Uh, the idea that uh, the microbiota can actually um, generate um, or, or liberate uh, toxic uh, uh, compounds at the, in, in, or, or at least can biotransform drugs or compounds and lead to the accumulation of them in the wrong compartments at the wrong concentration to elicit toxicity. So I've had the, uh, the good fortune of being able to collaborate with this individual here, uh, Stephen Greenway. He's a pediatric cardiologist a lot more friendly than he looks in this picture. Um, 
but he he has uh, his, his specialization has been managing um, transplant patients um, in, in in his practice, and throughout his practice, you know, he's been um, very interested in this drug called mycophenolate mofetil. So this compound here is um, one of the um, one of the standard maintenance therapies for to prevent uh, transplant uh, rejection. Uh, and it's really safe in terms of uh, renal toxicity, so it's great for uh, patients who have had kidney transplants. But one of the big issues are the GI uh, side effects, and you know they they uh, they're pretty severe. They diarrhea, weight loss, cachexia, nausea, to the point where you know in the clinic they have to consider options in terms of you know how to 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 deal with these um, these 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 outcomes. And you know potentially changing uh, dosing regimens or even pulling patients directly off of this. So you know this is a real world problem that that Stephen and I have been trying to address. And you know this paper really highlights it. So again, I mentioned you know this is a very safe drug in terms of protecting um, uh, the 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 transplant from rejection, but also you know reduce toxicity directly on that organ. But there are patients that exhibit these gastrointestinal uh, side effects, and you know, in the case of dose de-escalation uh, or, or, you know, even completely stopping the use of MMF, uh, that becomes problematic because then you have this increased, um, you know, potential for, for the, uh, the graft to be rejected. And obviously, that's, that's the worst possible outcome. You know, we want transplant patients to, to be able to, to live you know, a good, high-quality life, uh, you know, with, with, their, with their new organ that's, that's benefiting them. So, you know, with, with these clinical findings, um, uh, Stephen came to me and said, "Hey, you know what? What, what do we know about this in terms of the GI biology, or at least, you know, the, the pathophysiology of this compound in the gut?" And when I'd been doing my my postdoctoral fellowship uh, with Paul Beck, who's a who's a gastroenterologist, uh, gastroenterologist, clinician scientist, he'd seen a lot of patients with this type of complication, and he termed it MMF-induced colitis. Uh, you know, for 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 the uh, the simplicity of, of of working in the clinic. But really, we didn't have a good idea about what's happening, and that that was about uh, probably about 15 or 20 years ago. You know, that I'd been introduced to this concept of of MMF induced colitis. So knowing that there might be you know uh, a direct effect of the compound you know within uh, the lumen, you know, we decided let's go ahead and, and try to make an animal model to test you know some hypotheses. And really, the first hypothesis that we went with um, related to the microbiome. So Stephen and I wrote up this case report um, of, of a patient uh, who uh, was a transplant recipient um, who was on immunosuppressives, but also unfortunately ended up getting uh, recurrent uh, C. difficile infections. Uh, and as many of you might know, uh, one of the, 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 the very, very efficacious treatments now for uh, recurrent uh, and refractory C. difficile infections is a fecal microbiota transplant. So in this particular case study, uh, this patient had uh, a number of, of um, microbial uh, transplants, and we actually followed the composition of the microbiota over the course of this patient's history, uh, more to be uh, more to assess the efficacy of of, of the uh, the transplant uh, of the fecal matter. Uh, but we actually got some some a really interesting signal that that kind of pushed us in the direction of studying the microbiota as a driver uh, uh, or at least a potential contributor to MMF induced toxicity. So I'm just going to walk through this this diagram here, and basically this is just compositional analysis. So this is beta diversity, beta diversity analysis of the fecal microbiota of this patient. So I'll start over here. This is uh, the first sample that we had, and this is when the the uh, the patient uh, manifests with uh, the first C. C. difficile uh, infection. And here, this is the donor from which the uh, the FMT was derived. So the first thing you see is after an FMT, this individual shifts to this, this bluish area over here. So clearly, you know, their microbial composition changed because of, 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 uh, of the, the receiving this, this FMT. Um, and, you know, the composition shifts kind of towards the donor, but again, you know, you're never going to get full engraftment of an FMT. Unfortunately, the patient comes back uh, to this area over here, and this corresponds, again, with the recurrence of disease, okay? So again, this, person, this, this patient has a recurrent disease. So, so we go ahead and we give the patient uh, another FMT. And then they're over here. 
and this composition here is is actually it's pretty close to the donor, and the the patient um, you know uh, ends up um, clearing that C diff infection and, and becomes fairly healthy for a good period of time. But we continue to track the patient, um, looking at their fecal uh, microbiota composition, and you can see it starts to move around a little bit over time. But what happens over here is really interesting to us, because you start to see this migration away from uh, you know the the donor phenotype. And these are the time points at which this individual manifests with the MMF-induced toxicity. So to us, this was like one of the first signals that maybe there was a microbiota component um, driving this toxicity. But again, you know, this is all association. We, we really have, you know, almost, we have, we, have, we have no indication of function uh, in terms of what the microbiota is doing in this context. So that was when obviously we, we needed to, to develop a preclinical model that would at least present with some of the, 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 the clinical signs uh, of MMS-induced toxicity. But the original hypothesis was that the microbiome would somehow, changes in the microbiome would somehow be uh, triggering this toxicity. Uh, and again, mechanistically, we had you know, very little idea how, how this was gonna happen, uh, but this was a very simplistic hypothesis that was gonna be pretty easy to test if we could develop the appropriate preclinical animal model. So that's essentially what we did. We actually worked with one of our veterinarians uh, in our animal facility who'd worked with MMF um, in his postdoc um, and essentially had, uh, had really optimized the concentrations of MMF in, in the chow to get the desired effect on, on the immune cell. So again, this, this is an anti-rejection drug that actually interferes with B cell and T cell metabolism and renders them inoperative in the context of organ rejection. So the first thing we saw was we developed this MMF-containing chow that, that uh, had been optimized according to um, the, my vet colleagues' uh, work. And what you can see is, you know, over the course of, of eight days, this is a fairly rapid weight loss scenario uh, in these animals. And you can see that you get the reduction in spleen size and also the shortening in the colon length. Shortening the colon length is one of these weird metrics that, that many of us in the gut field use uh, to indicate something is happening. And I say something is happening because I don't think it's a great metric of, of overall disease or inflammation, but it's, it's something that more often than not we see in the context of, of uh, an inflammatory scenario uh, within the gut. And again, this was pretty surprising that we saw it so quickly. And you know, we tracked the animals, the animals' food intake, the water intake, no differences between these groups. You know? So this was actually you know, part of what we see in the clinical presentation in an individual that starts to develop that toxicity. They get a pretty rapid weight loss and a pretty substantial uh, diarrhea phenotype. And we actually did some, some whole body imaging to actually look at uh, fat mass, but also uh, lean mass. And, and we saw the same phenotype, this cachexia-like phenotype, especially in the context of that lean body mass. So we felt like we had a pretty good model to work with um, to, to maybe start to address some mechanistic aspects of this toxicity. You know, and the first thing we did was, you know, if, if, if we truly believe this, this was going to be a microbiota-related uh, event, you know, animals that have no microbiota should not, you know, ha ha have the, the toxic phenotype. And, and that was, you know, pretty evident in our germ-free study. So we, uh, we took the, our chow, we irradiated it, and tested it in normal mice and still elicited the effect. So we knew that we weren't inactivating the compound. But in the context of a germ-free animal you know, that has no microbiota, we did not see these toxic effects, you know, suggesting that you know, likely the microbiota is playing some role. Is it playing a direct role? Is it playing an indirect role by regulating some immune process or epithelial process in the gut? You know, at this point, we can't say with this particular experiment. We did a similar experiment where we treated uh, you know, SPF colonized animals with antibiotics. Uh, to see if, if, you know, targeting the microbiota in, you know, a more realistic system, you know, where the animals developed with, a, with a, an intact microbiota, uh, you know, we might be able to see a signal there. And in fact, you can see that in the antibiotic treated animals uh, that have also been treated with MMF, those are these blue open circles here, you know, they listed, there, there was no body weight phenotype. So again, they, there, there was protection afforded by targeting the microbiota in that system. And again, you can see the colon here, and also the spleen phenotype as well. So it's interesting that you know, we have this, this clinical case study that suggests the microbiota is involved, and we're able to take two approaches. These are like the, the, the classic approaches that we use 
to try to implicate the microbiota in you know some sort of, uh, of of clinical response or you know experimental response that we see. It's also important to point out that with these two approaches, the transporters and the drug metabolizing enzymes that we know are involved in uh, in the biotransformation and elimination uh, of of uh, MMF, both of those uh, both of those areas were untouched by by these interventions. So it suggests that there's something likely local that's happening within the lumen of the gut um, that, that, is, that is basically um, being targeted or at least being uh, removed by uh, this germ-free scenario or an antibiotic scenario that's contributing to the toxicity. So that was great. You know, at the time, we had no idea what we were dealing with. And again, this was, this was beyond my pay grade in terms of understanding even where to go next. But, you know, we, we started looking at the literature and um, it was kind of funny because at the time, I I had a long-standing collaboration with Shreed Harmani working on the pregnant X receptor, and you know that's where you know I think Jeff and and, and my research programs overlap because you know we, we'd uh, we'd been very focused on the PXR in the context of inflammatory bowel diseases, so you know I started looking through the literature and I realized that that I had a connection with somebody who had been working on something similar. So uh, the Redembo Lab at UNC Chapel Hill, you know they they'd been had a long-standing interest in um, these microbial enzymes that seem to be contributing to GI toxicity of cancer-related drugs. And this is, this is one of their amazing papers where, where they basically figured out that there's a microbial enzyme, uh, beta-glucuronidases, that actually uh, will, 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 will act on a metabolite of a drug, liberate the active portion uh, of that drug within the lumen, where in reality it's supposed to be eliminated or at least removed from the body. And the liberation of that active compound was actually what was contributing to uh, the, the diarrhea phenotype in, in, in their animal model, but also you know, likely in, in, in the patient population. You know, so what they've been doing is, is they've been developing inhibitors of these beta-glucuronidases and really characterizing which beta-glucuronidase might be acting on a glucuronidated substrate to liberate the active compound and, and contribute to, to gut toxicity. So we, we started to, to, to like this, this as, as a potential option uh, for at least a potential hypothesis as to what, what was going on in our system. And we've connected with, with uh, Matt and, and, and formed a, a really solid collaboration related to this work. And you know, I think his, his next R01 is actually gonna be related to, to MMF-induced toxicity and assessing some of his uh, small molecule compounds uh, that would inhibit these beta glucuronidases but basically we had this 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 potential hypothesis to test and and, and we, we we needed to figure out you know to develop some assays in the lab to really study this but the 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 paradigm would be that the uh, glucuronidated uh, MPA which is the active form of MMF that would be in the lumen and ideally it's supposed to be eliminated uh, through the feces so that it you know doesn't uh, so that's basically mechanistically how it's going to get eliminated from the body. However, these uh, glucuronidases, so these gusses, they can actually remove that uh, glucuronide, and they do so to basically use that glucuronide as an energy source. So if you have a, a glucuronidated compound in the lumen, you're actively going to be selecting for these bacteria that actually express these enzymes. So in in, in our case, we hypothesize that. The glucuronidated MPA was actually being targeted by these GUS enzymes, thus liberating the active uh, MPA compound, which at high concentrations is actually toxic to, to the gut. So again, this, this kind of just highlights that pathway here, our hypothetical pathway. The idea that the, the prodrug, uh, you get the, uh, the liberation of MPA, which is the active portion of that, which, which um, uh, you know, again, has that immunosuppressive effects. In terms of elimination, you get the glucuronidation, which forms this MPEG. And MPEG, a lot of it is excreted in the urine, but there's also um, transport into, uh, into the lumen uh, of the gut where it's supposed to be eliminated uh, within the feces. However, we have these microbial enzymes that are expressed that actually deglucuronidate uh, MPEG and actually lead to the accumulation of the MPA within the lumen. Again, that was the hypothetical scenario we, we, we proposed based on, on the work by the Redembo lab. So we sought to actually test that. So the question is, how can we test that? 
the first thing we did was we actually looked at patient samples. And these were patient samples from individuals um, that were under um, uh, or, or taking MMF uh, for the purposes of, of, of post-transplant anti-rejection. And I just want to highlight here, these are three patient samples. On the, uh, on the y-axis here, we've got an enzyme assay to actually uh, assess uh, GUS activity. And you can see in these patients here, these three individuals, a lot of GUS activity. And these, these three patients here all had very, very severe GI symptoms and actually had to be uh, uh, removed from this compound to, to address their, their diarrhea and a phenotype and then also their, their wasting phenotype. These patients here, these four patients here that I've highlighted, these were actually patients um, that were actually pulled off uh, of, of, uh, of MMF. And you start to see you know, this, this reduction uh, in, uh, in, in GUS activity, which is likely because there's, there's, you're removing a, a selective advantage for the bacteria that are expressing these enzymes, because what they want to do is they want to take the glucuronide and use that for energy and expand. So we've probed this a bit further in patient populations, and we just recently published a paper with John Lee uh, at, at Whale Cornell, and you know we, we have a pretty good signal in terms of the GUS activity within patients correlating with these toxic outcomes, uh, especially within the gastrointestinal tract. But again, that doesn't really you know, get us completely to mechanism. That's still observational, what's happening mechanistically. So we wanted to see, you know, can we actually target the microbiota to reduce toxicity in our preclinical pre model? And you know, we took a, a, a very uh, you know, sledgehammer approach. You know, we use antibiotics and just tried to, to, to see which antibiotics might elicit um, you know, a, a protective effect. So previously we used a, a, a cocktail of ampicillin, metro, neo, and banco. Um, but what we wanted to do was see, you know, could one of these agents uh, afford protection? And might that provide us with some idea in terms of, you know, what particular microbes are driving this toxic effect? What you can see here is a control animals here, MMF animals here. Again, you can see that, that weight loss phenotype. But when we actually started vancomycin on day eight uh, of our MMF treatment regimen, uh, you can clearly see that their weight loss profile is changing suggesting that you know, vancomycin may actually be eliminating something in the system that's contributing to, to that toxicity. And you know, we went through a variety of, of characterizations in terms of looking at the inflammatory profile. And uh, you know, in, in summary, vanco was doing something different than all of the other antibiotics. And it looked like it was actually normalizing many of the features uh, of the phenotype that we were seeing. So you know, in order to, uh, to, to understand you know, mechanistically, again, what's happening there? What is Vanco targeting? Well, we did some microbiota analysis, and I'm just going to highlight a few things here. What you can see here in uh, the Vanco treated MMF group, and this is, this is day 10. So again, this is a couple days after we started that Vanco intervention. You get the loss of a particular class. And what's interesting about that particular class is it actually shouldn't be targeted by vancomycin. So I show this, these data to, to all my microbiology colleagues, and they say, that doesn't make sense. There's no way that you should see the loss of that particular class in the context of vanco treatment. But we've repeated this multiple times. And, and again, these are the data that we get. And, and so there's some difference in the predicted or at least uh, you know, currently uh, known uh, spectrum of activity of vancomycin uh, and, and some of the data we're generating. But again, we're starting to see this, uh, this honing in on, uh, on a microbial mechanism uh, in terms of toxicity in our system. So we went a little bit further. And again, we wanted to look directly at, at, at GUS activity and see you know, if we treat animals with vancomycin and they're getting better, is that truly associated with a reduction in, uh, in, in gut luminal uh, GUS activity? So we have a fluorogenic substrate that um, once it's acted on, by uh, the microbial GUS enzymes, it actually liberates a light signal. And we can measure that light signal by whole body imaging or whole, Im uh, whole organ imaging um, you know, to look at, to really look at regional uh, GUS activity, but also the magnitude uh, of GUS activity in the context of our interventions. So essentially that's what this shows here. You can see in the control group, you know, they do have you know, some GUS activity. Uh, this is the, the small intestine leading to uh, the colon here. And you can see in the MMF group, you get this increase in, in the, the light signal, which is indicative of more GUS activity in the system. What's interesting is it, is it actually 
um, you know, it, it ends up being within the colonic region, which is where we uh, where we see the uh, the toxicity in, in, in our in our animal model and also uh, in patients. When you intervene with vancomycin, you get a substantial reduction in in that gus activity. Again, suggesting that whatever we're targeting with vancomycin is in fact the the gus expressing uh, bacteria that is leading likely leading to that 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 toxic phenotype we're seeing. Now to get to that 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 functionality even further, to really to really say you know is is there a difference in the liberation of MPA in the system? We actually did some some additional uh, measurements of, of of the metabolites, so that's depicted here. So again, the MPEG is the glucuronidated uh, form that's supposed to be eliminated through the GI tract through the feces, and these GUS enzymes will liberate MPA, which at high concentrations is toxic in the gut. So what you can see here, these are the control animals here. These are the, sorry, these are the MMF only group. And you can see in the feces, we have fairly high concentrations uh, of, of MPA. If you intervene with vancomycin, these levels absolutely drop. And you know, the, the, the hypothesis, or at least the conclusion that we're making from that is when you give vancomycin, you're actually targeting the, the bacteria that are expressing these GUS enzymes so we don't have that, that, that substantial liberation of MPA within the lumen, and therefore we don't have that GI toxicity. You know, what, one of the key things to mention is when we do intervene with vancomycin to, uh, to target the, the gus expressing uh, bacteria within lumen, you know, we don't have any changes in, in, in the, the systemic uh, concentrations of MPA, suggesting that you know, if, if, if we wanted to and, and we needed to, it's possible that in, in, in the, the context of a human patient, you know, we can still get the immunosuppressive levels systemically of this compound, and we might be able to alleviate, you know, the GI toxicity by targeting uh, bacteria, you know, with vancomycin. Again, vancomycin is unrealistic. No one's going to be using vancomycin in the, in the context of, of a patient that, that uh, presents with uh, GI toxicity associated with this drug, but, but it started to lead us in the right direction, and now what we're doing is is trying to work with uh, Redembo and, and see if we can find some small molecule inhibitors that target the, the particular isoform uh, of the GUS uh, to, uh, to, to alleviate toxicity. So again, this is, this is the model that we're working with. Um, the idea that the MMF is a prodrug, it gets modified such that MPA uh, becomes uh, uh, liberated and, 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 and active in the system uh, within the liver, you know, we have this enzyme that glucuronidates and inactivates MPA, and MPAG is supposed to be excreted through the fe fecal matter, but in the context of, of, of this, this moiety that, that, that has this glucuronide, you're actually selecting for bacteria, uh, you know, that, that, that will then liberate uh, through the action of these beta-glucuronidases, liberate MPA, and elicit the GI toxicity. And one of the big questions we're asking now is, you know, why, why doesn't everybody present with this? You know, if, if you're actually selecting for beta-glucuronidase expressing bacteria by having this glucuronidated MPEG in the lumen, wh why, is it, why is it not leading to toxicity in every patient? And now what we're thinking is there might be a composition of the microbiota that we might be able to associate with this type of GI toxicity. And the idea being that if, if, if we can find out uh, a specific microbial signature that's associated with high baseline uh, GUS activity, we might be able to predict who's actually going to respond negatively uh, to, to MPA uh, and either consider an alternative uh, anti-rejection compound or uh, enhance the monitoring uh, of those, those patients to, to be sure that we don't end up uh, with, with a very, very severe toxic phenotype. So I'm going to just have a quick break here. Because I understand, you know, we're, we're we're all zoomed out, and I want to I want to address any any quick questions uh, about this part of the talk. Are there any questions about this part of the talk? Feel free to to unmute and and, and ask questions if necessary. I'm getting silence at this point, so I'll, I will move on to the next story then. You know, this uh, this story is is completely unpublished. Okay, and you know, I'm, I I I would love any any input. Uh, Critique as well, uh, input uh, thoughts and and you know strategies as to how to move this forward. This will likely be the the work that my senior postdoc moves forward with 
you know, when he starts his own lab, which, uh, you know, fingers crossed happens in the next uh, six months. So this is, this is an idea of, you know, we have the toxic meta metabolite side, uh, side of things, but in general, you know, how does the, 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 the microbiota govern global metabol uh, metabolism uh, within a host? And this story kind of has a really odd beginning. So um, when Kyle started in my lab, he, he'd been working on host microbe interactions and, and had just published a paper looking at uh, this particular microbe called uh, segmented filamentous bacteria. I'm gonna call it SFB for short. And a lot of mucosal immunologists were, were really interested in this particular bacteria um, because it had a, a, a very prominent role in uh, the development uh, of, of the T cell compartment uh, within, within mice. So the story plays out, and this is, this is a really elegant cell paper by the Littman Group in, 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 uh, in 2009. The story plays out that animals from two different vendors exhibited different T cell profiles in terms of the magnitude of, of the T cell profiles. And I've just depicted the T cell uh, subtypes here Tregs, Th1s, uh, Th2, Th17. Jackson Lab C57 black six mice have low levels of Th17 cells. And if you are going to use, uh, if you're going to use an animal model where Th17 cells are involved in the pathogenesis, you likely get a very moderate to null phenotype uh, in Jackson mice. Whereas taconic mice, they have very high levels of Th17 cells. Uh, and you can see. There, there's this really nice difference in terms of the, the colonization uh, with SFB. So essentially Jackson lab mice, they're SFB negative, uh, if you will. So in this particular study, what they did was they actually took um, fecal matter uh, from uh, taconic mice and put it into Jackson lab mice to, to see what would happen. So they, they did this fecal transplant or they co-housed again, exchanging the microbiota, uh, you know, a, a number of different mechanisms, you could do that. And what they actually found was they, they got this induction uh, of, of, a, of a TH17 uh, cell population. So these Jackson mice receiving, uh, you know, SFB manifest with a, a TH17 response. And people have gone on to characterize this. They've monocolonized mice with SFB and co-housed them with Jackson lab mice. And They've, they've basically outlined the mechanisms by which the SFB uh, leads to this expansion of, of a TH17 uh, uh, cell population, making them you know, appear more like uh, a taconic animal. So again, they, they had this idea that you know, there's, there's clearly a difference between um, the, the animals that have SFB and don't have SFB. And what Kyle did in, his, in, in, in the spare time that he has, which is not much because he's constantly in the lab, was he actually took the approach of, let's look at the published microarray data. And instead of looking at the targets of interest that, um, that uh, Littman's group did with this, this 2009 paper, he actually looked at the most down-regulated genes in the small intestine. And the reason he did this is the SFB colonizes the small intestine, and that's where they think a lot of the effects are actually happening uh, in terms of regulating the mucosal immune system, um, you know, to, to, to get that TH17 response. So he went ahead and he took that, the microarray data and, and did some data mining. And what he found was, was remarkable. I'm going to highlight here. He found that in animals that have SFB, the most downregulated genes related to drug metabolism. And uh, one of the important ones that I want to highlight that I'm going to talk about for the rest of, of the presentation is the CYP3A11. Okay, this is one of the key uh, uh, enzymes for drug metabolism. Uh, and uh, the human ortholog is, is CYP3A4, which many of you likely know plays a role in drug-drug in interactions. So, you know, he, this was an interesting observation. He, he saw this and he said, well, you know, I think we, we need to probe this a bit further. Being pharmacologists, you know, who obviously are trying to use our knowledge to develop drug regimens and drug uh, target uh, identification, you know, he said, well, let's, let's, let's probe this a little bit further. So I just want to get into the idea of, of the first pass effect. And you know, those data were taken from the ileum. So you know, why do we even care about drug metabolizing enzymes in the ileum? And you know, I, I kind of overlooked the small intestines, uh, or at least the, the gut walls, role in, in drug metabolism for a long time. 
you know, as, as I was trained as a pharmacologist, I think I was, I was really, um, the, the focus was very much on the liver, you know, phase one, phase two, drug transporters and so on, and, and their role in drug metabolism and biotransformation. What I didn't appreciate was you know, how, how much um, function there is within the, the epithelium of the gut uh, in, in terms of being able to metabolize and detoxify drugs. I guess it makes sense given it's, you know, it's, it's the interface between a lot of, you know, the environmental factors that we take into our bodies. But you know, I didn't appreciate you know, how, how much of an impact that first pass effect via the epithelium has on drug, drug metabolism. But clearly, when you take a, a drug orally, you know, that drug has to get across the epithelium in order to you know, enter the circulation, go through the liver, and, and likely have, you know, its, its, uh, its effects systemically. When you look at the intestine, the majority of, uh, of the composition of the drug metabolizing enzymes comes from the CYP3A family. So again, CYP3A, um, uh, we saw CYP3A11 uh, or sorry, downregulated in, in the SFB colonized animals, plays a huge role in, in, in drug metabolism. When you look at the literature, CYP3A4, which is the human ortholog of, of 3A11, the mouse, 60 to 70 percent of orally administered drugs are metabolized by CYP3A4. You know, so it's a big player, and and you know many of us know that when we're looking at uh, drug drug interactions or even looking early early preclinical at drug responses, we want to make sure that a compound that we're testing doesn't induce 3A4 because it's likely then going to have a drug drug interaction uh, if we were to move it to to preclinical or clinical trials. So really, 3A4 has been, been heavily studied, and, and it's likely been the, the driver of a lot of, of, of the pharmacogenomics um, studies and, and understanding uh, interpersonal uh, or sort of variability between patients in terms of their responsiveness to drugs and also toxicity. So suffice to say, 3A4 and 3A11 in the mouse, huge player in terms of drug metabolism and, and likely a huge player in, in the first pass effect when drugs are taken orally. So the hypothesis that, that we came up with that, that really stemmed from mining the, the microarray data was that, that a distinct microbiota, or at least you know, one particular component of the microbiota, and I should have said that this is actually a commensal. So this is not pathogenic. This is a commensal uh, mouse uh, uh, bacteria. So this commensal, we hypothesized, would actually change the profile uh, of drug metabolism uh, in, in, in the host. So the first thing we did was we went ahead and we, uh, we got some um, uh, feces from an SFB monocolonized animal. So that animal only has SFB uh, in the lumen of the gut. So when we transfer feces to an SFB negative Jackson animal, we're only transferring SFB. And the arrow here points at uh, 3A11 and a couple other SIPs. We were able to recapitulate the data published in, uh, in that microarray. So the signal's real. We're getting a nice down regulation of CYP3A11 uh, when uh, SFB is introduced to the system. We went, went a little further and we, PCR, we did some PCR in a variety of sections within the small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And you can see in each case, when we give a Jackson mouse, which is SFB negative, uh, monocolonized feces from an SFB uh, monocolonized animal, SFB is on board, you get the down regulation of uh, 3A11 in all of these regions. And I really wanna point out that this seems to be region specific. It's not happening systemically, it's not happening in the liver. So there's some interaction at the level of the microbe with the, uh, the, 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 the mucosal environment that is driving this effect in a very localized manner. Uh, very much like we did with MMF, we wanted to actually look at activity and see if we could look at regional changes in, in the function of 3A11. So we have a, a, a substrate that uh, once uh, metabolized by 3A11 and some other SIPs uh, will elic uh, elicit a light signal. And you can see in these Jackson animals, you get a really nice uh, light signal emitted suggesting that there's a, a really good amount of 3A11 activity uh, in the small intestine of these animals. You throw SFB on board and you get you know, a reduction in that um, metabolism through 3A11. And you can see the, the quantified data here. So again, highlighting, or at least suggesting that SFE in our system is in fact 
reducing 3A11's expression and also activity uh, uh, in, in, in the small intestine. So that was great. You know, we had indications that the, 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 the gene is down, the function is down, but who cares? You know, does, does, it, does it even, you know, mean anything in the context of, uh, uh, you know, drug administration and, you know, subsequent action in the system? So we took two drugs, the first of which is, is uh, gliburide. It's an old anti-diabetic drug taken orally, um, and it induces uh, the beta islet cells to uh, secrete insulin. The nice part about it, the reason we chose it, is it's heavily metabolized uh, by 3A4 in, in humans, but also 3A11 uh, in mice. So what we did was we dosed animals uh, with gliburide, and we just did a simple glucose challenge. And the hypothesis would be that if an animal has been administered SFB, they should have less 3A11, so more active compound should get uh, into the body to elicit a greater reduction in glucose levels. So we should see more efficacy uh, of an equivalent dose in an animal that is treated with SFB. And that's in fact what we saw. You can see here, the black lines depict the normal um, change in uh, blood glucose levels in an animal treated with gliburide. And you can see in an animal that's been given SFB, which we've shown reduces the expression, also function of 3A11 in the gut, you actually get a greater response. So more active compound is actually reaching the systemic compartment because you've got less 3A11 to elicit that first pass effect. And we've gone ahead and actually done the, uh, um, the, the assessment of, of metabolites. And we do see this uh, in terms of the active compound being more available in the, uh, in, in the blood uh, of animals that have been treated with SFB. So that's great. I mean, that's, that's one compound taken orally that elicits this, this change in glucose. The second drug we used is midazolam. So this is a hypnotic sedative um, and it's like, it's the prototypical 3A11 metabolized drug in, in studies where they want to look at regulation of, of 3A expression and, and function. So what this drug does is, you know, it, it, it elicits this effect on animals. One way to look at it is the animals that are dosed with midazolam go to sleep, and then you can measure how long it takes them to wake up and become active again, okay? So again, the hypothesis would be that in an animal treated with SFB that has this downregulation of 3A11 uh, expression in the gut, they should get more of this compound actively into their bodies, and they should exhibit more of a sedative effect. Uh, and essentially, that would, in our, act, in our assays, manifest with a change in activity. And that's essentially what we saw here. So you can see these are uh, movement tracking uh, measured in a laborious apparatus. So we throw the animals on there after we dose them with midazolam, we track their movement, and we see you know, how, how, how does that change in the context of SFB administration. So these animals here give midazolam, they wake up, they move around pretty well because you know, they, they obviously have a, a, a period of time for recovery, but you know, they, they eventually start moving around and they're pretty happy. In an animal that is given SFB to reduce that 3A11 expression and subsequently given midazolam, they move a lot less after recovery. It takes them a lot longer to recover and their movement is substantially less um, after, after that dose. And that's highlighted down here. So again, it highlights the fact that we're seeing more activity, more systemic activity of an orally administered drug when a single microbe is on board which we know is associated with that decrease in uh, drug metabolism function and expression in, in the gut. So, you know, we, we, we have mechanistically, uh, or at least we have this observation, and now we have to delve into the mechanism. What's happening here? You know, what immune cell is playing a role? I did highlight the, uh, you know, the TH17 side of things and the introduction part of this, uh, of this section of the talk. We, we disproved that right away. You know, we, we did some uh, experiments in rag deficient animals, um, neutralizing IL-17A. That's not playing the role. The other side uh, of, of this SFB story is that SFB can actually uh, induce a, a population of innate uh, um, lymphoid cells, these IL-C3s, to evoke a, an IL-22 response. And IL-22 is... Uh, a cytokine that can act on the epithelium and do a variety of things. It can elicit antimicrobial peptide secretion. 
uh, it can elicit a, um, uh, a healing response uh, within the mucosa, and that's of interest uh, to us in the context of inflammatory bowel diseases. But, you know, we, we wanted to probe this a little further. You know, is IL-22, the reason that we're seeing this downregulation of the SIPs and this, this change uh, in, in systemic drug delivery. So this is a bit of a busy slide here, uh, but, you know, what we did in this particular experiment is, is, is we took RAG-deficient animals, uh, which lack B and T cells, and then we depleted ILCs, all the ILC population, excuse me, uh, with, a, with a depletion antibody. So what you can see here is SFB elicits this really, really nice downregulation of 3A11, which we'd seen before. Um, but in the context of ILC depletion, we, we lose this effect. And when you actually do flow cytometry to look at the immune cell populations, you can see here in the control animal, there's a subpopulation of IL-22 expressing Roar gamma T expressing cells. These are these ILC3s that, that we think is the, is the source of IL-22 in the system. If you throw SFB on board, you can clearly see an expansion of these IL-22 expressing ILC3s. And again, when we use the depleting approach, those ILCs are gone. So, you know, this effect that we're seeing here, this loss of response to SFB is associated with that loss of the ILC3, uh, IL-22 expressing population. And you can see here that's depicted on this side as well. So, you know, pretty good evidence that ILC3s expressing IL-22 are playing a role in this downregulation of the SIP that we're seeing in response to this microbe. And I don't have time to, to show all the data, but we've done this uh, in IL-22 deficient animals, and we've also used an IL-22 uh, neutralizing antibody, and, and we've seen the same thing. So we, we are pretty confident that IL-22 is the, the prominent mediator that is driving down the expression of 3A11 in the epithelium in response to this particular microbe. So that's great. You know, we wanted to get into it a little bit more mechanistically. You know, this is kind of how we started to translate, uh, or at least move towards translating it to the, to the human scenario. These are mouse small intestinal organoids. These are the ileal organoids that we generate from crypts that we isolate from, from mice and, and we grow them in matrix gel and they form these nice 3D structures. When we treat these organoids, which are epithelial in, in nature, with recombinant uh, mouse IL-22, you can see this nice reduction in 3A11 expression. We've also looked at activity using a, a, a variety of different probe-based assays. And again, you can see that IL-22 stimulation down regulates that 3A11 activity. And also, you know, we've done some, some basic microscopy, some very preliminary microscopy, and we're seeing the same thing. So we've got IL-22 acting on the epithelium to reduce SIP 3A11 expression and activity, which again, you know, correlates nicely with what we're seeing in the whole animal. So that, that's great. Again, this is a mouse. A mouse is not a human. Our goal is to translate all of our findings to the human scenario. Uh, sorry, I, just, I should also point out that uh, we did intervene with some, some pharmacological agents to see, you know, which signaling pathways are involved. And the effect of IL-22 on the system is, is sensitive to uh, STAT uh, signaling blockade. So we do think that it's, that it's a STAT signaling um, pathway that's, that's downstream from, like, prototypical IL-22 receptor signaling that's somehow downregulating 3A11 in our system. So that's great. As I mentioned, you know, that's a mouse. But what about the human scenario? Uh, we're lucky enough that, that we have some very, very talented uh, gastroenterologists in, a, in our group who do a lot of colon cancer screening. And in the context of colon cancer screening, um, our uh, GI colleagues, they actually like to scope all the way in to the ileum so that at least they know that when they're doing surveillance and pulling their scope out, that they've covered the whole colon so that they don't miss any polyps that you know, likely can, can contribute to, to cancer. So really for them, getting into the ileum is, 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 is something that they do regularly in a quote unquote healthy control population. This is routine screening that we're talking about. So in this context, our GI colleagues will go in, they'll give us uh, a mucosal biopsy uh, that we can isolate the crypt stem cells and we can make these human intestinal organoids from the small intestine. And we can treat them with IL-22 to see if the same things are happening uh, you know, with, with this response. And basically what we found 
uh, in these in three separate patients that we developed these cultures from, we found that the same pathways uh, were downregulated in response to IL-22. The same drug metabolizing enzyme pathways were reduced in these uh, human intestinal epithelial organoids. And I should also point out, sorry, um, whoops, uh, sorry. And this, yeah, the, these are these are you know further analysis of the same RNA seq data. You can see that uh, depicted on the left, some of the most downregulated um, genes are associated with drug metabolizing pathways. Uh, so IL-22 is definitely having a similar effect in the in the human epithelium that um, is 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 occurring in in, in our mouse model. And this is what I wanted to say on the previous slide. We've also seen the same thing in duodenal uh, organoids. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a collaboration with um, uh, a group that does uh, beta islet cell uh, preparations, and when they get pieces of the pancreas, they often get a chunk of of um, uh, the human uh, duodenum. So, so we can generate organoids from that, and, and we've seen the same effect there. So it looks like, again, within the small intestine of the human, IL-22 is, is, is controlling drug metabolism enzyme expression. Okay, so this is the model we're working with right now. And, you know, we're, we're trying to wrap this story up, and, and this is acting as a platform for, you know, for Kyle's future work. But the idea previously had been, you know, oral drugs, you know, simply get into the system, there's likely some contribution of the epithelium to their biotransformation or metabolism. Then you get the liver, then you get the systemic uh, you know, distribution uh, of a drug. But I think we need to start thinking about the role of the microbiota, you know, in all of this. You know, what's the composition of the microbiota? You know, what kind of IL-22 inducing bacteria do you have in your system? Does it matter if you have early life um, exposures that might change the the, the IL-22 producing propensity of your mucosal immune system? These are completely open questions. But, but I think given, given the, the drastic um, uh, effect we're seeing of you know, a single microbe inducing a single cytokine and this, this, this pretty prominent change in, in drug metabolism, you know, I, I think this is what we have to take into account now as we're doing preclinical trials, but also um, you know, looking at modulating the, the microbiota in health or disease. So again, this is the model, the idea that the gut microbiota seems to be inducing um, you know, this, this ILC3 uh, population of cells to, to secrete IL-22 and have that effect directly on the epithelium to suppress uh, 3A11, or in the human's case, 3A4 expression. And again, I want to highlight that you know, 60 to 70% of, of drugs taken orally are metabolized by 3A4. So you know, this, this, is, this is likely something's happening in the human population that I think we need to be aware of. You know, as we start to develop more targeted therapies, or even if we're considering, you know, personalized medicine approaches. So, you know, who cares? What's what's really the impact of the work? And, you know, we we present this, and it's a nice story. SFB is 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 a mouse commensal. There's really nothing like that in the humans. But there are other challenges, enteric challenges, uh, that elicit IL-22 responses. A lot of enteric viruses will actually elicit IL-22 responses. So it's likely that IL-22 is going to be evo uh, 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 at least produced in certain contexts, and I think we have to be aware of it. The second side of it is, is IL-22 production is actually regulated by circadian uh, processes. So there might be a sweet spot that we can actually dose patients with, with, with specific drugs that um, that'll allow them to get you know the, the, the best systemic delivery, or avoid toxicity. So again, this is all speculated. This is all pie in the sky at this point. But I think there's, there's definitely room for that. But really, you know, what we're getting at in, in, in our lab, I think now is combining the principles of pharmacology with the principles of host microbe interactions. And the idea that we, I think we have to take all of these things into account. And obviously, we can't discount genomics because there's, there's you know, really, really good data, uh, you know, pharmacogenomic data that that uh, I, you know that describe why people are, are di responding differently to to different drugs, but I think the new component is really the the the, the, the microbiota. We have to take this into, into account. And again, when I was trained as a as a pharmacologist, there's no way we were thinking about host microbe interactions. And I would say I didn't start thinking about this in, until about three or four years ago when Kyle came to the lab and said, you know, I think we need to to start thinking about this because of of, of toxicity associated with microbiota compositions and so on. So you know, I think it's pretty clear, you know, that we have to consider 
targeting the microbiota could be a, a, a good idea or a good way to maybe enhance drug efficacy or at least reduce toxicity. Now, the one thing I really want to point out is, you know, we, we've, we've implicated IL-22 in our story. There, there, there might be some, some, some worry uh, in, in terms of developing IL-22 centric therapies uh, for use in, in human populations. So Genentech has got a, 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 a pretty substantial IL-22 program. We got the knockout mice and the neutralizing antibody in collaboration with Genentech. Um, they're very interested in, in trying to deliver IL-22 to the gut, uh, uh, and, and all, there's other indications, but primarily to the gut of inflammatory bowel disease patients to enhance mucosal healing. And I've had some discussions with them, and I've, I've let them know that, you know, we're seeing this, this, this modulation of, of drug metabolizing enzyme expression. You know, my, my, my concern is, you know, as agents like this move forward uh, for clinical trials, you know, we might start to see uh, some signals, some, some deleterious signals. You know, so I guess the question really is, you know, are we going to see uh, adverse drug events, uh, you know, related to um, administering IL-22 within the lumen of the gut, which, you know, as I've shown, likely will regulate the first path metabolism at the level of the epithelium. So, you know, I think my, my takeaway for this, and it's, it's something that I'm trying to integrate into how I think is that, you know, obviously I wanna develop drugs to, to treat disease. And as a pharmacologist, that's, that's, that's what I would like to, to deem as my goal. But we were taking too simplistic uh, of an approach, I think, in, in how we understand how drugs are handled by the host. And I think we really need to incorporate the microbiota into our thinking. Uh, and it's, it's going to require a lot of interdisciplinary research. Uh, it's going to require pharmacologists to interact with microbiologists, to interact with immunologists. And, you know, as we kind of step into those other fields, we're going to feel remarkably inadequate. Um, I, can, I can say uh, as a pharmacologist, I feel remarkably inadequate regularly going to, you know, hardcore immunology or hardcore microbiology seminars and also collaborating with those individuals. But it's also really fun. Because again, it, 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 everything's integrated. And when you, when you find these, these things mechanistically that are integrated, that actually could have a translational value, it's, it's really exciting. I'm pretty sure you can tell I'm excited about you know, this, this area that, of, of research that we're going down. So lastly, acknowledgements. I've got a great team. You know, we're a small lab, uh, but we have a lot of fun and we work really hard. We play hard and we work hard. Um, but, you know, we have a small lab, but we have all these collaborators that, that have been amazing in terms of their support, um, you know, guiding us in certain directions, dealing with our, you know, very ignorant questions, and really helping us move this forward in a very interdisciplinary manner. Now, so this is, this is the lab here. This is, you know, Kyle's a pretty serious guy, but every now and then this comes out of him. This is, this is our um, pre-lockdown Christmas party in a park, uh, because, you know, that was all we could do, uh, given the pandemic. Um, but the last thing I want to show before we have questions, this is a treat for Jeff and also Dr. Moyes. I hope he's still on the call here. Uh, this, is, this, this is what I do in my spare time. Um, and I, I wanted to point this out here. Speaker uh, two or three weeks ago, Dr. Moyes, there he is. Uh, this is Gerald Samponi, uh, who played on the same softball team as our speaker, who spoke about retinoic acid a couple weeks ago. And I also want to point out that this is my senior associate dean of research. So, you know, not only do I get to collaborate in the lab, you know, with great people, but, you know, I get to collaborate outside the lab as well. So, you know, with that, I'll take any questions and suggestions. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on, on this project. I'm going to dig up the uh, URLs for that YouTube video, and I'm going to put it in the chat, brother. <laughs> I, I am duty bound to ask this question because of who and what I am. And that mm -hmm. is, have you done any of these experiments in the PXR knockout mouse, and is it just jack stat signaling, or is PXR playing any role at all? You know, we haven't, and you know, one of the, so I would say we are still very interested in terms of during colonization, is something like the PXR involved in, um, you know, the developmental increase of, of these enzymes in the epithelium that would be normal? Because germ-free animals, they, they, these enzymes are, are almost they're not there. So, so they, they don't have the, the SIPs, the SIP expression in the epithelium, but upon colonization, you know, these things go through the roof. So, you know, is there a, you know, a, a metabolic profile from the microbiota that is, you know, acting through a lot of these antibiotic receptors to, to drive these things up? 
And, you know, is that involved in these processes? We, we haven't looked, but, you know, that, that's, that's definitely something that we're interested in looking at. Uh, Dr. Schneider, go ahead. All right. Uh, Simon, thank you. It's a great presentation. And I look at it differently. I look from the standpoint of immunologists mm -hmm. and just mentioning about there are some strains like bulb C, you can generate mm -hmm. only C2, uh, TH2 type of response if mm -hmm. you compare with the uh, C57 blacks, which is primarily mm -hmm. TH1 type of response. Yeah. It's just for your expansion. Yep. Now, I'm very pleased because there are here students, year two students, who confirm that I teach the role of microbiota in development mm -hmm. of diseases and everything. So my suggestion for you, uh, actually, uh, I know a uh, plain golf I know, if you did not ask for, uh, for recommendation suggestions, just don't give it, but you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, and particularly about um, research, which your senior uh, PhD is going now with the L22. So, mm -hmm. but before we go in for that, all right, so your second slide in this presentation mm -hmm. showing the role of microbiota. And you know what, you miss it very important issue. Mm -hmm. When in early 2000, the sequence of human genome was complete, mm -hmm. immunologists were shocked because we don't have genes which actually would drive maturation of our immune system. Mm -hmm. Babies born, like you know, they are germ free, right? So at that moment, and after that, everything has started developing with the colonization. That is what I would put there definitely because it's mm -hmm. so important. I have multiple things here, but they okay. are not in, uh, uh, it's all positive. So no, no criticism. Awesome. But let me look at this issue about IL-22 and where to mm -hmm. proceed with that. If I am working and if it is my lab, a PhD student uh, working on that. I would consider to generate transfected bacteria, like the Clostridium mm -hmm. bifidum, mm -hmm. and after that, transfect with a gene L22 and the control of tetracycline. And after that, take your animals, populate, turn it on, turn it off, mm -hmm. and you can regulate this. And in this way, you can you can come and actually as a potential, potential mm -hmm. uh, treatment for, for all of these uh, patients which are hyperreactive to the uh, drugs mm -hmm. because they increase it. That is what my major suggestion for, uh, for you. And the rest is, uh, yes, and talking about like 22, uh, uh, ILC3 might be not the major producer of IL-22 in the mucosa area. So we know that surprisingly, IL-17 produce both IL-17 mm -hmm. and produce IL-22. That's how these cells can play two absolutely different roles. Mm -hmm. So if IL-22 is dominating, those IL-17s are actually homeostatic cells. They control mm -hmm. the tightness of epithelium, barrier, everything. But if they activate it, that is a switching balance towards IL-17. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the major cells because when you use RAG1, RAG1 deficient cells, they completely depleted B cell and T cells, mm -hmm. only yeah. uh, IL-C3 uh, because they don't have rearranged receptor. That's the only thing. But in reality, probably um, the focus should be on IL-17. And one of them also, uh, macrophages, All right? So, but yeah. that is what uh, cells, which the source of IL-22. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, with all of these suggestions, I congratulate you. I think it's Thank a Klondike you. where you work right now, because as I said, I teach my students and at the end of my lecture, I'm saying, hey, listen, if you don't believe it, uh, that it will be important in your practice in fa uh, 15 years mm -hmm. down or the road. So please remember my words. Yeah, right, no, so I'm that it will that. be, it will mm -hmm. be, and it's already, it, it is, because when I teach ulcerative colitis where, versus inflammatory bowel disease, where, yes, so where it's a Crohn's disease, it's a totally different. It is mm -hmm. all about shifting in microbiota. Mm -hmm. How to regulate it, very difficult, 
right? So you are a young researcher, therefore I can remind you something which you may also apply in your research. In the somewhere um, in the 80s, there was an attempt to, um, to modify those, uh, I mean, to, to make it easy recovery patients with massive surgery on GI. Mm -hmm. What they were doing is it, just wiping up completely microbiota, mm -hmm. putting on parental feeding, and after that rejection, whatever you, there is no inflammation, period. Mm -hmm. So, but what I'm saying, it's always very difficult to uh, change the uh, microbiota with transplant. Mm -hmm. It's all living pretty short time, but yeah. you can use this particular wipe out uh, microbiota and after that repopulating with your uh, strains of interest as a one approach, which uh, definitely will mm -hmm. kind of at least last the existence of this because mm -hmm. in any fecal transplantation actually uh, they return to normal I mean normal for this yeah. patient within six months mm -hmm. something like yeah. this and they were going to generate super bugs oh that is also double H sword because at some point those super bugs which can survive mm -hmm. and expand can turn back they will yeah. be run away so mm -hmm. that is what is a concern but congratulations Thank you I very much. I, I wish I'm 30 years younger and I <laughs> work and something like that. Otherwise, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I think, I've, I, think I see uh, Dr. Uh, Wolf there has got his hand. Uh, before Dr. Wolf, I'm going to throw okay, it to sorry. student Dr. Nanini. Yeah. It's good to hi. get Go ahead. Uh, hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, Thank you for the discussion. And I think that the microbiome is definitely an understudied area and something that I'm also looking into in terms of my own research. But, and you kind of touched this towards the end of your uh, slides and you presented RNA-seq data. My question mm -hmm. is you had a Venn diagram of different uh, kind of interactions with different studies and everything else. How much would you say the um, contribution of host uh, genomics and potentially Post epigenomics kind of contribute to the microbiome because there's this kind of discussion in terms of, you know, is it more so the genetics or is it more environmental? But for your own results, how much does the genetics, epigenetics, et cetera, kind of contribute to that? Yeah, you know, the, the epigenetic side of things, we, we've, we've not even touched it, but you're right. I mean, th those components, they've got to be in there because, you know, when you're dealing with you know, essentially environmental exposures within the lumen of the gut. You know, the, 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 the gut lumen is the exterior environment, right? So, you know, we, we know that, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in the epithelium for sure, you know, huge, huge epigenetic regulation of a variety of processes. So, you know, I, I don't, I think in, in reality, there's probably host genetics that might likely govern how you respond to IL-22 in, in, you know, in our model and also epigenetics as well. So your point's well taken, you know, we, at, at this point, it's it's already complex enough for me to understand, but you know we're going to have to go down that route to see you know if this is going to work in humans, you know are we going to get stymied by epigenetics or host genetics? But great, great point, Doctor. Great, Wolf? thank you, Doctor Wolf. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I, I was going to follow up on Doctor Schneider's comment uh, with the IL seventeen, IL twenty two, mm -hmm. and not that I know a whole lot about it, but I was curious. Uh, I was uh, interested years ago in the notion that high sodium diet increases mm -hmm. IL-17. And so I'm going, gosh, does it do in the, in the gut as well? Because the person that I'd seen was looking at the skin. And I, I did a Google search and yes, it goes up in the gut as well. And so I was wondering if you'd considered the impact because uh, along with what Dr. Schneira was saying, I'm going, it seems to me that IL-17 and IL-22 mm -hmm. are potentially interacting in some way mm -hmm. and that, that perhaps by modifying the sodium diet, you would be able to alter um, the, the ratio of IL-17 to IL-22 or whatever. That, that was the one, <clears throat> one perhaps foolish thing that I thought of. But the other one, I, I was uh, unable to get unmuted when you asked your question earlier, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, discussed okay. your first yep. stuff. And what I was fascinated by with there was that you kind of had like a gentamicin toxicity problem potentially, in that mm -hmm. you didn't, when you gave the drug and now it's being continuously released there that you were not allowing your resident population of lymphocytes to 
get the the guanosine made that they needed that you had you had created a sink for mm -hmm. the mycophenolate such mm -hmm. that that they were exposed to it for a longer period of time which then led me to my question of when you actually look at the walls mm -hmm. of of that of your colon there have you uh wiped out a lot of your immune cells in there and if that was the case i was going to suggest that you might be able to to somehow deliver in a scene or something like that i don't know if it would work mm -hmm. but if you could deliver the precursor that those cells are needing to survive mm -hmm. uh, when there wasn't a a valley below that which they could function normally that uh that you would circumvent the problem so long mm -hmm long explanation there perhaps complete so, so your, your your first comment is is I've, I've i've never even thought about that uh, you know so that's really cool you know and that's that's something we we, we know that that il-17 plays a role in in, in uh, enteric infections and in clearing of enteric infections and there's got to be a nice balance there so in the context of high sodium you know what's happening there no idea so I'm, i i wrote that down and i'm gonna i'm gonna definitely take a look at that the second question we were surprised when we did the, like the, the the histology, but also flow cytometry in terms of immune cell population. I, I would have expected like what you, you would have said, right? That, you know, you get the accumulation of the agent that's supposed to basically wipe out immune cell populations. And one would have expected to see, you know, more of a signal in terms of say, you know, B cell, T cells, other cells, you know, going down. It was not, it was not remarkable. It was not what I would have expected. So, you know, there's something else going on there, I think, where, where maybe, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I can't really explain it, to be honest, why we're not seeing that, but that's, that's a great point. And I, I can't explain why we didn't see that. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Student doctors. First of all, uh, student doctors in the room, thank you for attending. Appreciate that. If you like this seminar, um, tell your friends. Um, another okay. heads up people. I put a couple of links in the chat, if you click on those, you'll see and hear Dr. Harada's amazing rock and roll. I thought there was a person in the chat that had a question that you didn't call on. Yeah, I I have a question if there's time, okay. Jeff. Go it's, ahead. Uh, Alex, Simon, that was fantastic talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm, I'd am i love to follow up. I could speak for hours about this, but um, Jeff actually just reached out to me with uh, with a link about one of the genes that you had upregulated was RDH7. It was a mm -hmm. regulator of retinoic acid metabolism. And yep. I know that, um, I wonder if you reached out to, um, to Nina Isoheranen, she's in Seattle, mm -hmm. and she visited Kansas a while back, and I, okay. I'm sure Jeff remembers her, but um, they worked on the induction of IL-22 by retinoic acid. Mm -hmm. um, I can, um, it's a paper that was published in Immunity in 2018. And RDH7, yeah. which you picked up in your screen, is the gene that they knocked out in the intestinal epithelial cells mm -hmm. for that study. So I'm really interested in the fact that you not only have a, you seem to have kind of formed, you completed a loop. Like in that study, they knew IL-22 was regulated, but but the interaction with drug metabolism is fascinating. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, it's a very, very impressive story. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Thank you very much for a great talk. Thanks for pointing that that out. You know, it's it's funny because when I highlighted some of the genes, I saw that, and 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 I don't think I appreciated it. But now going back to the IL twenty two side of things, I vaguely remember that paper, but I'll have to go back and 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 dive back into it. Thanks for that. That's awesome, Dr. Schneira. I have just a very short comment about so uh, IL seventeen uh, CD four cells, which mm -hmm. are differentiated from uh, naive cells. And the major transcriptional factor which determines differentiation of those naive cells into TH17 is RORIT. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is what also links to exchange uh, what, what you just, Alex, talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah, good point. Okay. Awesome. Well, this is great. I th thank you very much all for the input. This is awesome. This is kind of, you know, another set of eyes helps helps us, you know, really move this forward. So thanks a lot. Appreciate it. That's why we do it. <laughs> Anybody else? Speak now. Forever hold your peace. 
Uh, Dr. Rada, I've recorded this. Would you like to exclude this from the web, given some of it is unpublished? You know, we, we've talked about it enough at places. If we're going to get scooped, we would have been scooped already. We're all, always worried about the scoop, and it might happen, it might not. So, you know, I'm okay with it. Chance favors okay. the prepared mind, and you're obviously one of them. Well, we, we got to get, you know, maybe it'll motivate us to get it done. <laughs> Something that makes me feel good is it's not the smartest uh, person in the room it's the most earnest that wins the race per se <laughs> and you're very earnest so you have no fear not, not, not always very smart i can tell you that much <laughs> dr clausen good to see you again uh student doctors thank you for coming and uh i think i'll end it here if there's no more questions um i somebody did... promised to show me some some uh surprise so we finish it with this lecture at the beginning. You remember? Uh, what is you? I don't. I, you know. Dennis? I don't have any more surprise. I don't have any more surprises. Sorry. No, no, no. Somebody mentioned that uh, Alex, please stay. I have something to show you. Surprise. Was it Doctor Wolf? Dennis, was it you? No. It could I, be I me. Be it could be me. I just put a um, a link in the chat. Uh, if you guys can double click on that, it's a draft agenda for the research symposium starting next week on Tuesday. Uh, Dr. Jeff Molkentine will give a keynote speech. Uh, it's a student kind of KCU centric event. Uh, but I just thought I'd provide to those in this room a preview, a surprise of the draft symposium schedule. You'll have to double click on uh, that draft in, in the chat. And I encourage everybody to come. It's again an open Zoom room. Uh, and there's also a speaker, Dr. Rina Fukunaga, later in the afternoon, keynote speaker number two uh, from the CDC regarding COVID and lockdown and, and mm. other interesting things. This is a rough draft. Uh, I'm about to finish it today, so don't distribute it beyond this room, uh, but it's there for your perusal, okay? Got it. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank see, you. See you next week, hopefully. Have a great weekend.